So hi, everybody. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, OK, cool. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm head of security at SDF. And uh, hopefully today you, you learn um, a lot about Soroban uh, and how to, to write a smart contract on top of Soroban. And I mean, uh, as you all know, security of smart contract is, is critical. And so uh, at the foundation, we want to provide the ecosystem and the developer with as many tools as possible to um, feel confident about the security of their smart contract and to be able to test, uh, to test their code. Uh, so we, we discuss fuzzing, which is great. And um, now, today, we want to talk about um, another, another way to test the security of your smart contract and, and feel confident, um, which is formal verification. So this is where Sertora uh, enter. I think, Molly, Alex, you can come here and start plugging your computer. Yeah. So this is where enter Sertora. Um, so Sertora is a, a leading company in the space of uh, formal verification for smart contracts. They worked with top protocol like Aave, Compound, um, Lido, and uh, they are working to integrate Soroban, which is uh, great. So we are very excited to, uh, to have them here. And they are going to talk a bit more about uh, what they are doing and how they do it and how that, that's going to benefit the, the Soroban ecosystem. So that's Molly and Alex. Stage is yours. Oh, and computer is working. That's great. So this will not be working. Uh, maybe not. Oh yeah. So I guess this is no. Not, it's not fine. Yeah. It's fine. I'll manage. So thank you very much, Thibault. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I actually want to invite Sophie. Can you just come, just say hi? It's uh, she's the one who actually made this partnership start. Uh, so. Sophie is actually used to work at Open Zeppelin. She has been in this space for a long time. We are hoping, I mean, it's a technical talk, and I apologize, it's a technical talk, but it's, I want to actually start it as more as a collaboration. I think already Tom mentioned, we are here to help. We, I've been working, you can see that I'm probably the oldest guy here. So I've been working in formal verification for ages, but we think that actually DeFi and, and crypto, it's actually a very interesting domain for formal verification. And I think that's actually one of the things that we learned during these five years that Satora has been around is actually from client, what is formal verification. So maybe just, and Alex will help me if there will be a few minutes, he's an architect in Satora and he's been around for four years with us. And he's actually gonna help us with a little demo if time permits. So how many of you are, are not coders? Maybe you can lift your hand if you are not cold, not that many, but okay. But we'll try to make this talk interesting for you too. So this is, uh, of course, not news for everybody that we see the DeFi adoption is kind of interesting that is basically start very high and then it's uh, now some kind of a bear market, but still it's holding off. The thing which is maybe a bit more surprising to some of you, what happened in terms of hacks in DeFi? So that's actually, you see the hacks in DeFi, and you can see already something interesting here. Does anybody from the audience see something interesting here? Yes? It's going down, it's, it's going down and up. It's going down that there are fewer attacks, but there are more, more there are smarter attacks. And that's very interesting what's going on. The people are, the hackers are getting smarter, and we as tool builders, you see, we're getting get, uh, better, and it actually we work well together. So it's a kind of a chicken egg what's going on in this space. So uh, as Thibault mentioned, we are working on formal verification. This is a, a very, uh, well, it's, a, it's a mature field of computer science. There are a lot of good things that people say about it and bad things that people say about it. It's the idea is that you want to secure code. You want to take code and make and basically give a mathematical proof that the code behavior is expected for this talk, I'm going to take some kind of a slightly different approach. And actually, we learned during working with clients like Ave and others, how do clients look into formal verification? So that's interesting. So this is something very different. How many of you are familiar with the Jurari window? Jurari window? 
So you should take a look. It's a beautiful idea. It's actually an idea that has to do with social sciences. You want to give somebody a feedback. You want to give your employee a feedback how good they are. So you're basically looking and you're saying what is known to him and what is known to you. Okay? And this is how you give people feedback, right? You come to your employee, you are a manager. I, I wasn't a manager, but now I'm a manager for a few years. So you need to, to give your employee feedback how good they are. And you, you can see that you can give them something about the blind spot, but you, and, this is, and you can also tell them about things that they, are not, they do not know. So what do we do in Sertora? We in Sertora, we do auditing sometimes. And we check properties of the code. For example, we check so some kind of property that you do not want to do like reentency attack. So this is a blind spot. We check these properties. But we also protect them sometimes about unknown attacks because we have the specification. And even more interestingly, we find bugs before they're deployed, we find unknown attacks. And I can show you, and if you look into our website, you see that actually one of the things that we are very happy is the number of bugs that we have found in these formal verifications. So people think about formal verification as proofs. We think about formal verification as finding bugs early. And I think we have been working with a lot of very good clients in this space, and the question is, why are they using this formal verification? So we already seen from Thomas' talk that code here is, is small and amenable to formal verification. Also, code here is almost like hardware in the sense that once it's deployed, it's very hard to change. So bugs have huge costs. And of course, we heard from Brian's talk that fuzzing, fuzzing is great, but what we are looking in formal verification, we usually look for bugs that multiple events occur together. So these are bugs which are very, very hard to find, and this is what we are trying to find with formal verification. And maybe another thing which is different, I work actually in avionics software in the past, but also you have software, but this is a software that you have criti software critical uh, system which is implemented every month. Okay, if you look into the Airbus code, I work in the Airbus code, it's a 30 years code which, no, which never changed. This is the case that you are writing this safety critical system all the time, so this is why we have people working with formal verification. I want to point it out actually two of our clients. So Maker, of course, everybody know, implemented the stable coin. So Maker actually, they are they're actually working with our tool alone, which is interesting. They used to work with other tools. Now actually for four years, they, have, they are working with our tool alone. They are writing their own specs. And one of the things they have done, they wrote the spec for the stable coin. You know what happened? They found that it actually is violated. So this is a four years old bug. It's a $6 billion uh, 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 potential error. So they found it with the tool. And LIDO is uh, our recent client that do liquid staking, and they are actually also using us to secure their code with formal verification. So formal verification is just one method. There are a lot of very good methods for this. So I think we heard from Brian talk about AFL, Fuzzers. Fuzzers is very interesting, for example, in the area of blockchain. Many of our clients using Foundry. These are very good fuzzers. The other one which is useful is static analysis. A lot of good tools, specifically in the Ethereum, the Slitter. We have our own static analysis implemented in Satora. And what we are doing in Satora, this tool is called automatic formal verification. And it's basically the idea is that you, you can think about it as a compiler that compiles your code into a formula. We are not the only one who's doing it. There are other companies. I can explain if you want. And I think uh, Tom mentioned in his talk that there's other players in this space which are also playing interesting roles, like runtime verification, and there is the lean. So these are tools which are called proof assistant. It's a very different approach to formal verification, but also useful that you start with the spec and not the code. So basically, just if you want to take the easiest thing to do, which you must do in your code, is fast testing, it's easy to use, you use it, we also use it. But it's hard to find bugs, especially if these bugs happen very far from the initial state. Okay, if they happen after many things, it's a bit hard to, and I think Brian also mentioned it. The static analysis is also a very useful technique that people use in industry. The problem of static analysis is false positive and false negative. And we use static analysis in Sertora, but it's hidden from the user. It's actually used to improve our, the performance of our tool. It's not something that the user is aware of. But it's something that we are doing, of course, it's part of our secret sauce. And we use 
the technique of automatic formal verification and other tools like Daphne and others. And the idea here is that you reduce the code into a formula and the human just write the, the invariant. The, the, the beauty of it, it, it finds bugs and it also finds bugs that happen when you start from arbitrary state, not just from the initial state. The bad news is this is expensive. It takes a lot of running time and it takes a lot of cloud and this is where we are helped here to help. And the last technique which is very useful, people have used it for example, the Cox system has been used to prove the, com the, the C compiler. That's a very interesting approach, but this requires a lot of people. Usually we say that something like for every 100 lines of code, you need one PhD. And this is not what we are doing at the moment. I, am, I have supervised many PhDs, but I don't have enough PhDs for the smart contracts, okay? So maybe since I'm old, I want to sort of give you a little bit perspective of this domain. It's a, it's a bit of a, sort of how I look at things, uh, but bear with me. So this formal verification, I think I mentioned, it's a very, very mature area of computer science. In computer science, there is what's called Turing Award. The most number of Turing Award is in, in, in formal methods. A lot of very good people. So of course, the guy who started formal method is Turing. If you read his original paper, it's actually beautiful. It's explained many of the things about formal verification. And then they come this golden age. These are very good people. Robin Milner, Tony Hoare, with the Sarah Tony Hoare is still actually alive. Uh, Edgar Dijkstra, Patrick Cousseau is still alive, and, and Robert Ford. So all of these guys, they did sort of, they, they, they laid the foundation for formal verification. And they, in particular, they said something which I don't agree, but many, many people quote about formal verification, that testing can only show the presence of error and not the absence of error. And this is sort of saying you should not do testing. I do not tell you that you should not do testing. You should do testing and formal verification. And they are all useful. And interestingly, and that's actually where I started my career, I started my career where formal verification was out. And you know how formal verification went out? I think there was a combination of many things. I think it was, there was a hype that people say formal verification is, is, the, is the cure for everything, which I tell, tell you it's not the case. And the other thing, there was this article that I really recommend by these three gentlemen from CMU. It's a beautiful article. If you, if you don't want to work in formal verification, read this article, okay? So this article explained all the reasons why you should not use formal verification, okay? And it does, I'm not gonna do the job, but they do a very good job in explaining why formal verification is not the cure for program correctness. Despite this article, and despite the fact that I knew about this article, I started working in formal verification. And I started working in formal verification together with many, many people. A lot of techniques were developed during this time. And I think, oops, Alex, what do I do? I just... Yeah, click. Uh, click on, okay. So uh, basically many, many things came which makes Sertora possible. Of course, I, I, I mentioned my own work on interprocedural, but I think the most interesting thing is the work by, and actually you see this is a quote, of Bill Gates on my own work, which is nice. Sort of, this is implemented in the, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, securing the Microsoft device driver. But I think I want to point out the Yikes. So Yikes is an SMT solver that is used in Sertora, CVC5 and, and, and Z3. So these are all tools that are used in the Sertora to make this formal verification doable. And there are more techniques, and actually we need more in this domain. And I think maybe the thing that happened that makes formal verification useful is actually this guy, Nick Sebo, maybe we know more about Vitalik, the person who said that, that you can write this small code that has a lot of value. So this makes the idea of using formal verification more applicable. And I think it's, a, it's for, and this is actually where I decided that in fact to shift my, 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 my effort into trying to get, make this uh, working, trying to make formal verification usable, but arbitrary engineer. And our dream is to make it like, just like as a unit test. So what do we do in Sertora? And hopefully you will hear soon how we do it for Sertora. We do two things. We have a language. It's not a programming language. It's called CVL, it's a Torah verification language. How many of you know it? Probably not, but it's good. Maybe after this project you know. So it's, it's, it's a language 
for writing specs. It's writing properties of your code. And you can use it in fuzzing. You can use it in formal verification. We have been writing specs for many of the DeFi's. And actually, we have people using the CVL. If you are, if you are a programmer, actually, this today, the other team is starting. Actually, now there's a competition for writing rules for other. Please join. You get $40,000. So there is, and we're going to do something similar for Cerebral with Code Arena and others. So the idea is people write rules. And then these rules are checked by the Sator approver, but maybe they can be checked by other. We also check the rules because sometimes people find bugs of us because we don't have the right rules. So we have an open source uh, 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 software called Gambit, which we'll develop, we developed it originally for Solidity, but now following the Soroban project, we will develop it for Rust. And the idea is we will mutate your code and see if it still passes the verification. And then we have the Sator approver. This is the technology. I'm going to hint about it. There's a lot of things about it, but this is the technology that we have been developing in the last five years. And it's actually the technology that checks that your code satisfies the, 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 the specification. So how does the Sator approver work? So you can, if you are a programmer, you can think about it as some kind of property-based testing. Or, but it's different than property-based testing in the sense that it's exhaustive. And it compares the program that you, you wrote to the program you wish to write. Okay, so you write the invariant, you write the property that you think, and you write the, the code. And this can do two things. It can give you the proof that the code does what it's supposed to do, but it can, it can also give you a behavior which violates the spec. And I think this is the most interesting thing. The, and this is actually where it differs from, for example, from proof assistant and other. That it's actually looking for violation. It's looking for cases that you are violating your property. Of course, since we are talking about problem which is computationally hard, we cannot always succeed because we are solving a very hard mathematical problem. So at the end, there will be some things. For example, you are writing a very complex mathematical equation. The tool will fail and it will run out of time and will not give you a result. And this is where we are developing a lot of techniques. And this, I think Tom mentioned in the talk this morning, this integrates into your development, like in your, in your, into your normal build system. So you build the code and you change it, and every time you change it, assuming that you have the same set of invariants, you check that they, they, are, they, hold, they, they still hold. Uh, inside Sator Approver, it's pretty tricky. There are a lot of things that we have implemented. Uh, we start, and this is of course something that we are doing now new for the, for, for, for the project with, with, with Soroban. We are going to compile from Rust to WebAssembly. And now from WebAssembly, we are developing a decompiler. This is something we have done already for EVM, but now we are doing the same. The idea is we, we actually decompile into our own internal representation, which is called TAC. It's something for formal verification. We also take the CVL and compile into TAC. And then we run static analysis to simplify the TAC. And then we do VC. VC is not verification. It's not VC like venture capital. It's verification condition. OK, here in the area of formal method to call it verification condition. The idea is you compile your code into a mathematical formula. And the mathematical formula describes all the behavior in which the code can violate. And then you feed it to off-the-shelf solver, and the solver solves the problem for you. This is where the magic happens. And the solver, of course, can time out. But the solver is solving the problem for you, and the solver is finding a violation. It can even generate a proof that says that there is no violation. So maybe I give you a very, very simple example. Here is a very simple code. Here is a very simple invariant. And you see how the tool found the bug that if you transfer money from yourself to yourself, it is violated. So that's the kind of bugs that we are looking for. You see, there is simple code. And actually, this bug, I think, about $15 million was lost just by this kind of bug. So this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to prevent these kind of logical bugs. When you fix your code, we will not tell you that you don't have bug, but we at least will be able to prove that this invariant is maintained. So we'll give you a mathematical proof that, the, for example, the total supply remains the same. We'll give you a mathematical pro proof of this property. How does this work in terms of auditing? So some of the things that people used to say about formal verification, that it makes this replace auditing, it's not the way we look at it. We look at it as complementary to auditing. We look at it as something that supplements the auditing, and that's the way we do. We take the, you take the code, 
you, start, you write the design and you go to the code, and you want to write the specification. You want to write the specification as early as you can, either using our language or using other things. And then what we will do, we take this formal specification, we will check it, but we will also check that the code satisfies the, the specification, and every time we have a bug, either we will report to the protocol and the protocol fix. And finally, when we deploy the protocol, we will deploy the protocol with the audit report, which will include the environment that we check. Of course, you can think about it as a fragile thing, because the hacker now know what are the environments that we check. But we make the code more secure, because we have all these environments that, that, are, that are there. So I want to give you an like, uh, uh, interesting box that we found. It's a... Uh, uh, it's uh, starting for Alex demo, so I want to give you some bugs. And these are bugs, usually we work with fantastic clients, they write the spec, and they, they love for us to find bugs, but they don't love so much that we, write, we will tell about them, okay? But this is the reality. But in fact, we find many bugs and we love bugs, and this is an interesting bug that was found by the tool. And actually, it's a bug that happens in compound in earlier version, but it happens actually in other DeFi. So what's going on here? You have a data structure. You have a data structure that remembers who holds the collateral. So you see, all Alice holds zero, Bob holds 59. And then, because of the way it's implemented in the blockchain, because it has some gas issue, there's also a bit vector. There's a bit vector that remembers who holds some money, you see, because it remembers that Bob has some money and whatever. And this is a data structure. And the idea is there is a code that manipulates the data structure. And we had the people are doing tap correctness or whatever. But the problem, once you have code, you can have bugs and you can have logical mistakes. And our tool will find the logical mistakes. How is the tool looking for the logical mistakes? You have to tell the tool what is the truth, what is correct. Okay, so, so this is what we tell the tool. We tell the tool an invariant. And here the invariant is very, very simple. It says that if one of these guys is non-zero, then you must have to have the right bit set. It's a very, very simple property. But you know what? It's violated. It's violated. And the tool actually found it. Uh, Alex, you think we should ask them what's the bug? Or? Uh, it's very quick. <laughs> Are you guys quick in writing solidity? I'm not very good in that. But the Slotar Prover is much better than I. But you the idea is so actually... I don't think there's a lot of time, but the idea is what happened is that they have changed the representation. And actually, it's, it's not calling the, right, it's Alex, it's... So the U and A is the problem. Right? Yeah. And actually, there's another bug that this, this, is, this, this is finding. So bottom line, you write this invariant, and then you're finding the violation. Okay, thank you. So this is the idea. I have five minutes, I want to give a little bit. So that's the idea. What is the effect of this bug? This bug means that you deposit the asset and they are lost. But we have other bugs which are even worse, that actually allow you to steal Thomas' asset. Okay? So, so, that, so we, we are finding all of these bugs before the code is deployed, hopefully. Although our tool works on the executable, but we prefer to work. We did find some bugs after code is deployed, but for us, the model we prefer is before the code is deployed. Okay, so I want to set up for the demo of, uh, of uh, uh, Alex. Uh, so this is, we, we, keep, we wanted to keep a very simple property. Maybe we're going to give two minutes out of time. So the property is that if, you, if I deposit the money and I withdraw, I don't gain from it anything. So you see, this is a case. Assuming you have a single user, you have an asset, you have a one-to-one -one ratio, and you see that the user deposits three, three dollars, it gets three shares, all looks good. And it's a one-to-one -one ratio, and the code looks good. But even this simple code, you can, you can tweak it. Because what happens is, because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, what happens is if there is some money in the, in the table, like 10, 10, 10 assets, then because the one-to-one -one ratio is used, then the user can deposit three assets and get 13 back. So this is not something you want. And this is something that we can find with formal verification, and you can see that in the demo. So I'll finish and let Alex do the demo. So I want to say just sort of uh, two slides. These are sort of, if you want to take something from this talk about formal verification, and what I'm telling you is actually something that 
a lot of people in this space feel, but not everybody, is what is formal verification? So if you ask people, and actually if you look into Wikipedia, formal verification is about proving correctness, and of course it's correct. But I think the thing that we are finding, and actually people have used formal verification hardware, they find exactly the same thing, that the biggest value of formal verification is finding bugs, and finding tricky bugs. The hardest problem in formal verification is computational. Of course, it's the case. It's a very hard computational problem, but we think that the hardest one is writing specification. That's why we engage in the community to write this environment that you can use in fuzzing or formal verification and other. The other thing that people say, and we've seen that people say that once you formally verify the code, don't test it. It's not the case. Once you formally verify the code, you only check the environment that you check. And people have found bug after us, for example, white hacker have found bug in the sushi after us because we didn't write the right environment. And this can happen. Okay, we are, this is the formal verification improve the code security, but there's no such thing as a, as a bulletproof. And there are a lot of things that formal verification does not catch. Of course, formal verification does not replace auditing. And maybe the thing that's important to say that formal verification is something that you want to use continuously, not as a one-off, and you want to use as early as possible. So I think this is the conclusion. Maybe you go to the slide. It's better to you go to the demo. It would be nice. And then we have a question. Uh. Okay, I'll try to be quick. Um, so let's look at. Let's. So I'm just going to show how. Um, uh, how, we, how we work with this rule. So this is probably small, so I try to make it bigger. Um, so the slide uh, that, uh, that Muli showed was um, what we wanted to say, or like what was happening there was that you would deposit and withdraw and you would get more out. So what we write is a spec that says this shouldn't happen. Right? So, um, I, I kind of highlighted with comments uh, what's going on. So this is CVL, this is our spec language. And you start from an arbitrary state, actually, so not from this. So uh, you, you don't have to fix anything like you would have to in testing. Um, and you, uh, you, you run deposit, and you run redeem, which is like withdraw. And we're stating here, this is kind of the core of the spec, saying you can't have received more than you put in. So um, let's look at the code briefly to, to give you an idea what's, what's actually happening on a deposit. Um, I'll try to uh, make it as clear as I can. So the main point here is that the deposit will, uh, so you deposit, say, dollars and it has to compute how many shares you get. And the rest is kind of uh, unimportant for the bug we're discussing, so I'm just going into this. So there is this convert to shares function, and it's going like this. Um, and I'll actually kick off the tool and then let you look at it again, and uh, maybe you, you, you see the problem. Um, so if you, if you want to run the tool on this, if of course prepared, it's still a bit small. So we, uh, yeah, uh, so, so I'm just telling it, so, so you get a Python CLI that interacts with the cloud and just telling it, run the spec file with this rule called no gain from deposit withdraw. And this will take a minute, not long, but uh, it's a bit of running time. So during this time, you can uh, have a look what's happening, right? So we get an amount of assets, and yeah, and then, then there's this total supply. So these were, this is like all the, all the shares that are in the contract um, over all the um, participants. And there is total assets, which is how many dollars, so to speak, external currency is in the contract. And from this, it's kind of natural to uh, have the price as the ratio of that, right? So then if you deposit, the, 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 the ratio doesn't change. Um, so you, yeah. Um, so can, can anyone see the, the problem here? Um, 
So then this function is called, right? So actually, in, in either case, whether it's... Uh, it's so, 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 so uh, if either is zero, uh, so if it's an end, e either way, so you get uh, as many... So if S is zero, you get zero out. You get zero shares. That's kind of fine. Um, if uh, supply is zero and um, there are assets in, that's kind of uh, where the problem is because uh, then it's assuming it's giving you as many shares as you're putting assets in. That's kind of what, uh, what is happening. That was the one ratio when there's not really a ratio because it's dividing by zero. Um, and let's see, Ooh, still running. Uh, yeah. It's going through the internet. It's always you never know. So, um, so I can uh, preview a little. Oh, still running. Um, so that that was what, what the table was showing, right? So um, you you ten assets are already there, um, zero shares, and then you put in three. And you actually get three shares because of the ratio of one. And three shares are actually everything. So when you take it out again, now the ratio has kind of been fixed. It's 13 to 3. But you get everything out. So And the plan is kind of that, you know, uh, the tool finds it with, with these numbers or with others, right? So there's, mm, there's more than one way to, to trigger that bug. So that's how it looks. So we get a violation for this rule. It's also specific to a given assertion. Um, it also, you can also look at the code that was actually under check. You get a call trace, like where, which path it took through the program. But for us, it's actually most interesting which values we got. This is a bit small. Can I get it bigger? Yes. Um, so the starting state here, ugh, sorry. Um, uh, I'm having size issues, but you can see um, the initial shares are zero, and the the assets it took five, and then what was being deposited it took eight. But as soon as long as the initial shares are zero and the other two are positive, you basically get everything out, not just what you deposited. And now, very quickly, um, I'm gonna let's fix the bug. So I'm open to, but I don't have much time for fixes. Uh, so, so I'm going to present a, a very easy one. So you can, but I mean, there are, there are smarter ones, right? But you, you can kind of fix this um, by, by basically just adding. So you, you're pre uh, approximating the real uh, ratio, but just adding one on the top and the bottom. And you, you kind of expect that. If the numbers are high, this number is, is this one is like nothing, right? Um, and then, so uh, so this is kind of what uh, Satora Prover uh, uh, can also do, not just find violations, but uh, it can also find a proof. So um, I guess this will run for another minute or two. So if if you want to talk, Kibo. Yeah. I think we're over time, so if you want to go get a cocktail or do something else, please I'm, do. I'm here today we, we, and tomorrow. Yeah. If you have questions, uh, but if there is any, if there is any question, even now. If um, there is a question that you want, to, yeah, a quick question. Maybe you have a mic here. Excuse me. You go ahead. Have, um, uh, Two questions. The first one is uh, I have uh, heard about formal verification but haven't worked with it. So basically what it's doing is like um, you are uh, making like a tautology and in, in logic way and trying to find the contradictions, right? Exactly, exactly. You can think exactly. about so it like invariable tautology is or maybe, maybe a more analogy is proving things by induction. Okay. You're starting with the state that satisfies the environment, and you're trying to see that it's maintained the environment, like you do in high school. But the idea is that in the tools like Quark or K, the human does it. Here, the computer does it. This is what Alex showed you. So the, so the idea is that we 
you write the invariant and we try, if we succeed, you saw it takes, we do this tautology for you. We, we have it, there's technology basically under the hood, there's problem called satisfiability and there's, there's, there's technology who's, who's doing it. Um, as someone that I actually work in, in security, uh, besides the paper you mentioned, uh, what do you recommend to read about uh, formal verification or learn about it a little bit? There are a lot of good material. Of course, we have our own, which is, which is uh, uh, on the white paper, but a lot of good material. Uh, look at the Wikipedia, look into Microsoft has a lot of system, including Daphne, which is similar to us, Lean, which is core. So a lot of people have that, a lot of work. If you also uh, ping me, there's a lot of documentation at different level. We are trying to make ours more geared to our developers, but a lot of good uh, documentation at different level. Okay, thank you very much. Question here. Hi, so yeah, I'm, I'm very interested how this would work with Rust, but... Um, we are, so we are b doing baby step. We have yeah. done already a prototype with Rust eBPF, and now we are gonna do it with the Rust WebAssembly. Okay, well yeah, so I ha there's the, a pro uh, project called Flux, which adds like liquid refinement types to Rust. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, would it be possible to sort of use that to generate the spec so that you have the spec and the code more close together? No, so that's not the way we work. We work, I didn't explain, but the idea is we try to write the spec, we kind of work in the opposite way. We try to make the spec reusable. We hope it's writing the spec is for us as hard as writing the spec. So we are trying to get the spec not like liquid type, and also we are looking into the logical uh, things. So we are, we are, we are, and also I did, maybe I didn't mention, we are not verifying the, the Rust, we are verifying the, the executable code. We are going into the executable code. Yes, Thomas. Yeah, I just want to add one thing on uh, Willem's question, which is refinement types is another uh, formal method. Uh, Ranjit Jala is working on this in uh, yeah. uh, San Diego, and we actually uh, have heard that there's already like a prototype of doing that for Soroban, so. Uh, hopefully, I, I think it's it's yeah. an interesting approach with the refinement type to basically do a refinement type is uh, is uh, the, like Ranjit and others. It's an interesting thing, especially if you want the user to not write spec and to write easier spec. One thing that we learn in DeFi, which is surprising to us, a lot of people say bad things about DeFi, but our 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 users we write work for, for example now with GMX, they write beautiful specs, and so they so we don't see the same so Rust. Uh, Refinement type is supposed to give you something like type system that you write the high level, you write the low level. We let the users like, in Alex didn't show, but in a, a CVL you can have quantifiers, you can have all the things that people are scared of. CVL, you can think about it like the, I don't know how you want to call it, the Swiss army of uh, formal verification. It's, a, it's something that, uh, and, and I think the, there's space for both. It's a, at the end. Maybe it's their, their approach is definitely, I think there's Nikki, is, she's here, she's in Madrid, and she's doing this uh, for Haskell. Yeah, yeah, great. More questions? Thank you for inviting me, I'm still here. Thanks, sorry I ran out of time. <laughs>